This is Duke University. Class, today my name is Neil Siegel and I co-direct the program in public law here at Duke Law School. Today is our Supreme Court review of important criminal decisions from the October 2009 term. Uh, I'm not going to give you the individual resumes of my colleagues. We have Sam Buell, we have Sarah Beal, we have Lisa Griffin, but I will tell you that uh, among the three of them is a group. We've got uh, many years of experience as federal prosecutors. Uh, we have an assistant to the Solicitor General, Supreme Court clerkships, uh, and other uh, varied experiences uh, in and out of government and the academy. And uh, without further ado, let's just proceed in that order. We'll start with Professor Buell, then turn to Professor Beale, and then finally, Professor Griffin. And there's a little time, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll say something about a case as well. And I also want to hear from you folks. I uh, will reserve time for your, your questions and comments as well. OK, good afternoon. It's great to see you. It looks like there are a lot of 1Ls here, because I don't recognize a lot of these faces. But I'm sure I'll be seeing a lot of you in the spring when I'm teaching criminal law. I look forward to it a lot. Um, so I'm going to talk about two cases uh, that were decided this term. We're obviously going to be very selective here. Supreme Court decides about 80 cases a year these days. And I don't know, Neil, how many are usually criminal? 30 or 40 a, a term, something like that? Um, uh, it's got to be you know, close to half the docket. So we, we can't possibly cover that. Um, so we, we've picked out some ones that we think are interesting. And, and the two that I'm going to talk about uh, briefly are a case called Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project and a case called United States versus Skilling. And, and these both got significant press, so some of you may know a little bit about them. Um, Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project is, was not a criminal prosecution. It was a uh, civil lawsuit brought by some people to enjoin, that is, uh, you know, get a court to order in an injunctive form, uh, that a particular criminal statute could not be enforced against them. You normally can't do that. You normally can't go out and, and say, you know, I'd like a court to tell the government not to prosecute me if I, you know, engage in activity X, Y, or Z. Um, you have to take your chances, and, and then if you get prosecuted and you think you shouldn't be, then you get to complain about why not. But when the First Amendment's involved, um, you can do this, uh, although it's mushy uh, to what extent you can do it. But that, that's what they, they did here. Um, long, complicated litigation in the lower courts. Let's skip all of that. Um, let's just talk about the statute. So this is a statute, a federal criminal statute, that makes it a crime to knowingly provide material support or resources to a foreign terrorist organization. And each of these uh, terms um, have separate meaning. Um, this is an exercise that we will do ad nauseum in my criminal law class in the spring, if you have me, uh, breaking down these statutes into their component parts and understanding what they mean. Here, here the key terms are knowingly. That's what we call the mens rea term. That is the state of mind. You have to act with uh, providing material support or resources. That's what we would call the actus reus or the act that violates the statute. And the, the what we would call attendant circumstance that those resources be provided to a foreign terrorist organization. Now, what, what's an FTO? An FTO is whatever organization the government has put on a list that it says are foreign terrorist organizations. So the government says, you know, the following groups are FTOs. Um, by the way, this mens rea term that you have to act knowingly to violate this statute was added fairly recently. Um, in a prior iteration of this statute that applied for a little while after 9-11, the government didn't even have to prove that the uh, violator acted knowingly. Um, but everyone agreed in Humanitarian Law Project that the statute required uh, no knowingly. Um, now, what is material support or resources? That's another key term in this statute. Well, it turns out the statute has a definition elsewhere of this. It's a laundry list of things. Uh, one good thing to do whenever you have a statute that has a laundry list of things and a definition and, and you're sort of worried about what, how, what does this statute mean, how far does it go, uh, try to pick out those terms that are most broad in the laundry list because those are the ones that are most worth worrying about. And here those, those were, um, quote, unquote, service. Uh, quote-unquote, expert advice or assistance, quote-unquote, training, and quote-unquote, personnel. So expert advice or assistance, training, service, personnel were all things that were a worry about their breadth. You know, if you, what, what do those terms mean, and uh, what, what are the implications of saying it's a crime to provide those things to some group the government has put on a list um, of a, 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 as an FTO? So who are the plaintiffs here? They were some people who wanted to help two groups. One, a Kurdish group that was fighting for independence in 
um, the uh, Kurdish region, region um, that, that uh, straddles the border between Iraq and Turkey, and a Tamil group that was fighting for independence in Sri Lanka. Um, and these groups were both groups that the State Department had designated foreign terrorist organizations on the grounds that they had been involved in uh, terrorist acts of violence. So the plaintiffs wanted to uh, work in connection with these groups in various ways, by donating money, advising them, uh, teaching them uh, to do things like how to petition the UN, um, and generally to speak out and advocate for their causes. And they uh, sued saying, look, you know, if we do these things, uh, we're worried we're going to get prosecuted for violating this material support statute. Um, and the statute, they said, is both unconstitutionally vague under the Fifth Amendment due process clause, which, uh, which has been interpreted over the years by the Supreme Court to impose a requirement that criminal statutes not be unduly vague. That means uh, that they not uh, be too difficult to figure out what they mean, whether your conduct would violate them, roughly. Um, and also, they said this violates our First Amendment rights to speech and assembly because we want to talk about what these groups are doing. We want to maybe get together with members of them, and those things are protected by the First Amendment. We're worried the statute would make that criminal. So uh, what did the court do? A majority uh, opinion written by Chief Justice Roberts and joined by five other justices said, look, there's no vagueness problem here. Uh, the actus reus terms in this statute, that is the definition of what counts as material support, is very specific. There's nothing vague about expert advice or assistance. There's nothing vague about training. There's nothing vague about service or personnel. We all know what these things mean. And uh, it's particularly not a vagueness problem because the statute says you have to do these things knowingly. And so if the defendant has to be aware, not, not knowingly in the criminal law means awareness of, uh, if the, if the defendant has to be aware that she is doing these things, then there's nothing uh, confusing or vague about whether you would be violating this, this statute. Um, now, the big issue, or a big issue at oral argument in this case, and in all the discussion that led up to it, was um, people throwing out lots and lots of hypos about, look, but what, look at all these things that could violate the statute. You know, what if you... Uh, uh, some member of one of these groups gives a speech on, on the campus of Duke University and some well-intentioned undergraduate decides to give him a ride back to the airport. Wouldn't that violate the statute? Wouldn't that be knowingly providing a service to a foreign terrorist organization? And the one that was a, f a favorite one in the oral arguments was, what about an amicus brief? What if you wrote a brief to a court uh, uh, saying, you know, uh, as an amicus, we would like to urge a narrower uh, interpretation of this statute, uh, federal court, um, because we think that would be better for these groups that want to do various forms of political advocacy, some of which have been put by the State Department on this list. Wouldn't that be a, a crime? How can it be a crime to file an amicus brief in this country? Um, and Chief Justice Roberts, in his majority opinion, said, um, none of these hypos matter. Nothing to do with this case. It's not what these uh, plaintiffs are trying to do. They're not asking for the protection of being able to file an amicus brief, and you know we'll deal with that case when we get it. Hypos don't matter. Um, so no vagueness problem. He then went on to say there's no First Amendment problem either because a uh, statute doesn't prevent you from speaking uh, about any of these things. You just can't do it with these guys. Um, so no, no First Amendment problem. And um, everything else you do that's not speech is fine for the government to say you can't do that because it's helping them. And they're engaged in terrorism, and the government has a little bit legitimate interest in regulating those things that help terrorists. And everything you do that helps an organization that is engaged in terrorism is fungible. So even if you're not doing something that's actually helping the terrorist part of what, you're do what they're doing, you're helping them commit terrorism because it helps them in other ways that you know, free up resources that they can yet then use to um, you know, purchase um, explosive materials or something. Okay, so there was a dissent by Breyer, joined by Ginsburg and Sotomayor. Um, they also said, by the way, without even talking about it, statute's not vague under the Fifth Amendment. Uh, but there is a huge First Amendment problem here, says Breyer. Um, this is all kinds of core speech that has been protected by a long line of cases. And the government's argument, I mean, the majority's argument about all help is fungible and, and, and the government's interest in regulating terrorism overrides all of this is, is an argument that has absolutely no limit. So the solution here, says Justice Breyer, who always wants to have a solution, 
Mr. Practical, uh, is we should interpret the statute to avoid the constitutional problem in the following way. The mens rea term knowingly applies to the word material in material support and resources, and material in the statute doesn't mean material like paper or uh, gunpowder or things like that. It means legal materiality, things that would make a difference to the outcome, a word that you may have already encountered um, in law school. If not, you'll be encountering it a lot. It's a term that appears all over the law that lawyers use to mean makes a difference, matters. So you have to have knowledge that what you're doing is material to the terrorism, would, would help the terrorism. And if we interpret the statute that way, it frees up all kinds of First Amendment protected activities is not covered by the statute. OK, in the skilling case, there was a similar problem. And I'm going to speak much more briefly about skilling, um, even though there's lots and lots that we could say about it, and, and certainly follow up with questions if you want to talk more about it. There, the, the question, no First Amendment issue, just a Fifth Amendment vagueness question. Is a statute regulating fraud that makes it a crime to deprive a person of their intangible right to your honest services uh, unconstitutionally vague, an issue that has been percolating for 20 years, 30 years in the federal courts. The Supreme Court finally took this up in the Skilling case. What's interesting about Skilling, and I don't have time to get on all the details of the case, but just in light of Humanitarian Law Project, is they took a completely different approach to the vagueness problem. In Skilling, they said, oh, there are all these hypotheticals. That could be, uh, you know, what about the guy who calls in sick for work um, and isn't really sick? Um, isn't he depriving his employer of the employer's right to his honest services by lying and saying that he's sick that day when he really isn't? Is that a federal crime? Well, it could be under this statute. And so this statute is clearly unconstitutionally vague. And um, it's so unconstitutionally vague that even if you committed what everyone essentially agrees is a flagrant securities fraud that brought down the fifth largest corporation in America, you too get relief. Um, that would be Jeff Skilling, who was also charged with securities fraud, and nobody said there was any problem with uh, the securities fraud part of his case. It's just that the government had two theories, securities fraud and this honest services fraud. The honest services fraud, unconstitutionally vague, down goes Skilling's conviction, or maybe so, we don't know yet. It, they remanded to the Fifth Circuit to sort of work out the implications of this. Um, and they narrowed the statute severely in skilling. They interpreted it as covering only now cases that involve bribery or kickbacks and ruling out everything else. And so why is it so different? I mean, why in Humanitarian Law Project do hypos not matter? And in skilling, uh, oh my gosh, look at all the cases this statute could apply to. Never mind that the, 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 this is the guy who destroyed Enron. Look at these cases over here. They're really a worry. You could get prosecuted under this statute. You should worry about that. But don't worry in Humanitarian Law Project because clearly you know, you're only going to get prosecuted if you're really helping the terrorists. Well, there are three possibilities. One, Humanitarian Law Project is a First Amendment case. Skilling wasn't. Two, Humanitarian Law Project was a case about national security and terrorism. Skilling wasn't. Uh, or three, it really does matter in some significant way that Humanitarian Law Project was brought as an injunctive action. Uh, uh, and what they were trying to do was get kind of a prior ruling about the scope of a criminal statute, whereas what Skilling was doing was the more traditional thing. Hey, I got convicted. I'm on appeal now. Um, I'd like to have my conviction overturned because I feel my case was, you know, uh, I, I'm the victim of a prosecution under an overly vague statute. Um, the court didn't say anything in either of these cases about that posture thing making a difference, but maybe it's a, it's a big part of the story. I, I don't know. Um, okay, there's lots more to talk about about these two cases. I'm happy to take questions, but keep it moving here. Thank you, uh, Professor Buell. Professor Beal. Buell and Beal. That's confusing. Uh, so I want to say a little bit more about skilling um, in the run-up. Um, all three of us are writing something about this or have written something about this. It's, it's a really quite an interesting case. So here's another possibility, so fourth maybe on the list, of why those cases come out the same. A majority of the court really doesn't like the mail fraud and wire fraud statute. They've got a B in their bonnet. They've construed it narrowly in other contexts. What is it that bothers them? So they're less bothered by that statute than they are, arguably, than by the material support statute. So yeah, the material support statute is about terrorism. But let's assume for the moment that we're just looking at what they did 
on the mail fraud and the wire fraud statute. They didn't actually hold that it was unconstitutionally vague. What they did was pretty broadly suggest quickly, without spelling out exactly why this was so, and looking carefully at each of the cases in front of it, they did kind of an on its face, without even explaining that it was on its face analysis, to get to the step of constitutional avoidance. They said, oh, you know, it could be unconstitutionally vague. Therefore, to avoid the possible unconstitutionality, we'll um, give it the interpretation that Congress would have wanted if it had known the statute might, might be unconstitutional. Well, that was pretty interesting because there are a lot of statutes that might raise constitutional questions. They might. And, you know, maybe sometimes Congress wants to get right up to the edge, right, and do as much as it can, and it doesn't mind if the court actually has to do the work of deciding whether the statute is constitutional or not. And this is one where the court had previously said, if you want to cover more Congress, you're going to have to speak more clearly. Within a, a year, Congress spoke more, more uh, clearly and applied the statute to this class of honest services kinds of cases. So there's already kind of a disagreement between the court and Congress about whether it was a good idea to have such broad authority in the hands of federal prosecutors that could reach into all kinds of cases, not just, although it certainly applied, to the largest collapse of a financial institution and securities fraud and so forth in the Skilling case. But the Supreme Court also heard argument um, this term in two other mail fraud cases, um, one of which in involved a state legislator from Alaska and was clearly a, a, a political corruption or political misconduct kind of case. So these straddled public and private um, sector uh, areas and uh, clearly involved all sorts of concerns about federalism, right? What kinds of things should be subject to federal prosecution, how broadly or narrowly this should sweep into all kinds of areas, not just securities fraud, but uh, the behavior of lawyers, the behavior of doctors who might make referrals, the behavior of local and state governmental officials, judges, and so it's really very, very um, useful and broad uh, tool for federal prosecution. And so the court had already signaled that it, it um, certainly earlier when uh, a number of the uh, current members were not on it, that it um, was not a good idea to put the, the sort of federal prosecutors in charge of standards of good government at the state and local government level, for example. Now, granted, the court didn't talk about that in this case, um, but it is interesting. Why did it choose to use the canon of avoidance and then pick an interpretation that nobody thought Congress had enacted, right? No one thought. Congress knows how to provide for bribery and kickbacks. It's got statutes that use those terms. Right, bribery and kickbacks. And that's not what it, what it enacted. It enacted this honest services language, which plainly was broader. So I think um, the, the interesting questions are um, about this question of what motivated the court and when it uses certain tools. Right, so it chose to use constitutional avoidance. Um, it chose to kind of take the policy choice from Congress about what the alternative would be without making the tough call about whether some broader uses of the statute actually were already constitutional. And in other cases, this same term, it made very different um, decisions about that. And it never seemed to feel the necessity to explain why it was doing one thing in one case and one thing in another. So in the Stevens case, it says it's not a good idea to read a statute uh, narrowly when the, in order to avoid constitutional problems, because that would take away Congress's policy choice. And it would remove an incentive for them to write it the right way the first time. Uh, eight to one. Eight to one in that case, not even mentioned in skilling why, in, in fact, they decide that for constitutional avoidance purposes, they'll read it narrowly. So there is something more going on that they're not telling us about why they choose certain interpretative moves in some cases. Um, and so which is the exception and which is the rule? Do you have to explain humanitarian law project? Do you have to explain skilling? I think, I think some of both, right? So it, it does, it certainly makes a difference that that's a terrorism uh, terrorism statute and that it was um, a uh, civil case, um, but more, more going on. 
Okay, so that's my number one case, or my half of my number one uh, case. Now, I want to talk to you about a case that didn't make a lot of press, and I think it's the most important criminal case that you probably didn't hear about last term, although there could be a lot of those, right? Um, it's a case called Padilla versus Kentucky. Could I see a show of hands of anybody that heard of Padilla versus Kentucky? Ooh, two. All right. Well, three. 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 Okay. So what did the rest of you miss? Uh, this is a case about um, the Sixth Amendment standards for the effective assistance of counsel in a very particular context. So the question was whether defense counsel's erroneous advice in a guilty plea case violated the effective assistance of counsel. What was the error? The lawyer told the defendant that he didn't need to worry about the possibility of being deported after he, if he was convicted because he'd been in the United States for such a long time. The defendant was a native of Honduras. He had lived in the United States for more than 40 years. He had fought in Vietnam for the US Army. You know, he considered himself an American through and through. Um, he had this tractor trailer. And he filled it with marijuana and was driving it around. And that was not really a good thing to be doing, although it may be a kind of an American activity. Um, yeah. But they don't like that so much in Kentucky. So, uh, so he was willing to plead guilty to it because they caught him with this tractor trailer full of marijuana. It's kind of hard to ignore a tractor trailer full of marijuana. Um, and his lawyer, as I say, said, don't worry. You've been here for 40 years. No problem. Mm. It was a problem. Uh, and in fact, um, the defendant's uh, uh, deportation from the United States was virtually inevitable. There's, a, there's a, just a hair's breadth of discretion left in the hands of the attorney general uh, if someone is convicted of a drug offense to uh, keep them in the United States. is never exercising. It's just this tiny little sliver, little crumb almost of discretion left, but essentially his deportation was going to be automatic. Now, why is this so important? There's a huge number of non-citizens who plead guilty in the United States to a variety of offenses um, where there will be adverse immigration consequences. And this extends the Sixth Amendment into potentially uncharted territory. Number one, immigration law is very complicated. Very elaborate. And number two, there are a lot of other kinds of potential negative consequences that might occur to an individual who pleads guilty. Like what? Like the fact that you couldn't be admitted to the practice of law? Hmm? Yeah, OK, right. Various other things. So how far does this idea go? OK, so um, what happened here? Immigration law has changed, and after the uh, amendments in 1990 and 96, it shifted from a system where the district judge who sentenced a defendant had the ability, ability to shelter him from negative Im immigration consequences. And it was very much a discretionary system. Not true anymore, right? And for a large number of offenses, there are negative immigration consequences. You will be deported. You won't be able to return. You can't become a citizen in the future, and so on and so forth. Now, having said that, do not rely upon my listing of those consequences, because it's actually pretty complicated, and the terminology is complicated, and so forth. Um, but Justice Stevens, writing for five members of the court, and notice he's not going to be there in the future. Right? Justice Stevens, writing for five members of the court, said that changes in immigration law dramatically raise the stakes for a non-citizen's criminal conviction. Accurate legal advice has never been more important. And therefore, the changes in immigration law confirm what he called the court's view that as a matter of federal law, deportation is an integral part, sometimes the most important part, of the penalty that may be imposed on a non-citizen who pleads guilty to specific crimes. And if you think about the, the relative importance, the relative importance, let's say, of the number of years, is it going to be three or is it going to be five, as opposed to being deported, never being able to return, and so forth, to a country that you may not even have any contacts with anymore. 40 years, we don't know if he even knows anybody there anymore. Um, the Sixth Amendment entitles the defendant to the effective assistance of counsel and more than 90% of defendants in all jurisdictions plead guilty, which means that counsel's principal duties in more than 90% of the cases involve advising the defendant about pleading guilty, which is what happened in the Padilla case. Most people aren't going to trial. They're pleading guilty. 
So uh, what, it, what is defense, the defense counsel's role? It's advising the defendant so that he can enter a knowing and intelligent plea. And that certainly includes advising the defendant about the potential penalty he or she faces, so the number of years, uh, whether it's going to be a felony versus a misdemeanor, uh, whether you'd be subject to supervised release. But what about collateral consequences, collateral consequences like not being able to be admitted to the practice of law? Um, the, uh, many courts had drawn a distinction between the direct consequences of a plea, the period of imprisonment, and other um, direct penalties that are imposed. And deportation and other consequences were viewed as collateral, not the direct consequence of the plea. And many jurisdictions drew that bright line right there and said that what counsel had to tell the defendant was about the direct consequences. In Padilla, the Supreme Court crossed that line to these consequences that courts had previously called uh, collateral rather than direct, although there's a little uncertainty about this. Because they say, as a matter of federal law, deportation is an integral part of the penalty. So one section of the opinion, even though it had been called a collateral consequence, seems to treat it as part of the penalty, which is interesting because it's a, that was a state case. How could the federal collateral consequence be a part of the state penalty? And it's a little unclear, right? Um, so uh, what must counsel do? Immigration law is complex. It's its own uh, specialty. Um, and uh, clearly, uh, when consequences are unclear or uncertain, uh, defense counsel is going to have to at least, at least advise that the plea might carry a consequence of immigration and certainly cannot uh, give incorrect advice, the court said, um, where the duty, or excuse me, where the deportation consequences are clear, where they're truly clear, got to give correct advice. They rejected the Solicitor General's position, which was the Sixth Amendment would be violated only by incorrect advice, right? If you give them a truly wrong answer. This is like, is their credit taken off for guessing wrong, right? You remember that in tests? Like, you need to know, you know, is it okay, right? Okay. And so uh, the court said that that was uh, not the constitutional standard. Why? Why? Number one, what would be the incentive to defense lawyers if you would only violate the Sixth Amendment? if you gave affirmatively wrong advice. Then the best thing to do would be what? Right? Say nothing. Right? They don't want you to say nothing. And uh, they did not want to deny defendants the least able to help themselves the most rudimentary advice. If it really is clear, then you have to, number one, you have to tell them and you have to be right. The concurring uh, justices, uh, Justice Alito, writing for himself and Justice Roberts, said, they thought the Sixth Amendment required something less. They were willing to go to immigration consequences. They were willing to cross what people had seen was that line. But they said, you may not, I love this, you may not unreasonably give incorrect advice. Apparently, there is some reasonable incorrect advice. You may not unreasonably give incorrect advice. Sufficiently clear. You, and um, all you have to do is tell the defendant a criminal conviction may have immigration consequences. And if the defendant wants to know anything more about it, he should consult an expert. All right, well, you know, what, what, would, what would you think most people would do, right? I mean, it would be that second line, right? There may be immigration consequences. Go talk to somebody about that. And will those defendants be able to do that? Who's, who's going to fill that gap, all right? Um, but it, it certainly keeps criminal defense lawyers doing the work they know how to do, right? They're, they're advising about criminal consequences. They're not expert um, in immigration law. Dissenting, uh, Justice Scalia writing for himself and Thomas reminded us of the language of the Sixth Amendment. Hmm. The right to effective, the, gives the defendant the right to effective assistance of counsel for his defense in a criminal prosecution. Effective assistance of counsel for his defense in a criminal prosecution. How is telling you what might happen if you were convicted and then immigration law had some effect? How is that for your uh, defense in a criminal prosecution? He said it might be a good idea for somebody to tell defendants what will happen in immigration terms if they plead guilty, but that's a matter of policy that should be addressed by statute, court rules, et cetera. Should the judge tell you when you plead? Should the defense lawyers have to do it? Should there be some separate group of people, immigration experts who would advise defendants? Somebody should think about that, but it's not part of the Sixth Amendment. 
What does it mean for practice? Um, there's massive training going on now for the defense bar. Right? They suddenly have a new job. So if you're thinking about doing criminal defense work, guess what? You now have a new job. Uh, and uh, various groups that are in charge of procedural um, rules and training and so forth are looking at the question, what happens at uh, the plea proceedings where a defendant um, pleads guilty? The um, group that writes the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure is looking at that question right now. Should Rule 11 uh, be amended? And how far does this go? Other collateral consequences? What about sex offender notification and registration laws? What about anything else? It's a slippery slope, some would say. I think the concurring and dissenting judges would say just the point. It is a slippery slope. There's lots of bad things. You know, you can't vote, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Where do you draw that line? Um, I guess we're going to find out, right? So we're going to be in line drawing. And I think I might be out of time. I'm out of time. Thank you very much, Professor Beal. And Professor Griffin. Um, so I'm going to uh, switch to a different amendment. I'm going to talk about the Fifth Amendment. Um, there are three uh, important Fifth Amendment cases in the last term. I'm going to try to highlight all three of those. And I, I chose this group of cases because I think it's illustrative of something that we've seen in criminal procedure um, in every recent term. Um, in the October term 2008, um, we saw the same uh, sort of activity with regard to the Fourth Amendment and the exclusionary rule. And in October term 2009, which we're talking about now, it very much focused um, on a, a similar uh, kind of um, Roberts court expression of a Rehnquist era desire to constrain rights and remedies um, that were first recognized during the Warren court. Um, and, and the last term was, was on about the Fifth Amendment, and specifically I want to talk about um, Miranda and Miranda rights. Um, so these are probably the criminal procedure rights with which everyone is most familiar. Um, you all you know, watch some media. So you are familiar with <laughs> your Miranda rights. Everybody knows what they are. Um, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say uh, can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. And if you can't afford one, one will be appointed for you. Um, those are the, that's the basic. There's no actual script that, that police departments, as we'll see, have to follow. In, in advising people of their, of their Miranda rights, but um, those are the basic rights. And it's so, I think, entrenched and, and um, deeply understood now as, as part of the panoply of rights that one might have upon arrest that it's hard to realize that this 1966 decision, United States versus Miranda, is the most hated and maligned, uh, I think, Supreme Court decision maybe ever. Um, it's mm, certainly Roe the least. Wade. Okay, Roe versus Wade. Okay, but it's similar to Roe versus Wade in some respects that'll that'll become apparent. Uh, you're right about that, of course. It's certainly in criminal procedure, um, <laughs> and and um, it, in, in some respects, sort of public opinion and public understanding about that group of rights has, has kind of caught up. The court, um, the Warren Court, was out in front um, on this idea, and um, it's important to understand what what Miranda, the Fifth Amendment does not actually include mention or guarantee a right to silence. That is not what the Fifth Amendment guarantees. The Fifth Amendment protects against what's called compelled testimonial self-incrimination. It protects against you being coerced into testifying against yourself. And what the Miranda decision holds, what's little understood about it, is that it recognizes that the context of being in custody and being interrogated by law enforcement is inherently coercive. So that we're going to, we're just going to cross that Fifth Amendment boundary and assume that you are being coerced to testify against yourself if you're being interrogated by law enforcement. Not because the Fifth Amendment guarantees a right to silence, but because the court in Miranda recognized that the only way to protect against coerced testimony was to recognize that when you're being arrested, when you're in custody, and that's a, a term that's slippery, um, or being interrogated, another slippery term, um, when those two are combined, that you're inherently in a coercive situation, that every suspect is, and that therefore we will recognize a right to remain silent and the right to representation in that situation. So that's the basic holding of Miranda. But at the time, in the late 60s, um, it was extremely unpopular. In fact, um, reaction against Miranda formed a, a touchstone of the Nixon and Wallace um, political campaigns. It was a very, very hot, toxic decision at the time. And what we're seeing in this court is a very mild version of a process that began in about 1972 um, when the court incrementally began to constrain exactly what Miranda means. 
1972 is when the Republicans uh, took control of the court. You have to always put quotation marks around the terms like Republicans when you're talking about the Supreme Court because it doesn't it doesn't scale. It doesn't carry appropriately into the court. But um, that is the year when uh, Justice Powell replaced Justice Black, and there was a conservative majority um, for uh, a cutback in some of the Warren era criminal procedure decisions. Um, when you're talking about control of the court, you also need some quotation marks, I think, um, because control of the court is very slippery, as concepts go uh, as well. But beginning in, in about 72, there was this, a fair amount of um, conservative control for a significant period of time, and it did lead to um, a process of accretion where, without overturning the Miranda decision, holes were punched in, in what it means um, and what it, the, the remedies that it's actually guaranteeing to safeguard the right that was recognized in Miranda. And in, in this term we have, so between 1972 and 2000, when there was a decision called Dickerson, um, there was this gradual process of deconstitutionalizing Miranda. There's been a big debate on the court about whether, um, sure, the Fifth Amendment is part of the Constitution, but is Miranda part of the Constitution? Is what Miranda says a constitutional rule, or is it just one possible way to guarantee a constitutional right among many other possible alternatives that you could choose to ensure that law enforcement is not coercing people um, when they're interrogating them. This has been a very controversial issue in Fifth Amendment interpretation. Um, Congress uh, passed a statute basically trying to do away with Miranda, um, saying that um, you could, that, and, and this is an interesting issue because we're, we're hearing the very beginnings of the possibility of not having Miranda in terrorism related prosecution. So there's some spade work being laid there that, that I think it's important to be alert to. Um, and uh, the short version of the 2000 decision in Dickerson, uh, curiously authored by, by Chief Justice Rehnquist, um, is that actually Miranda is more or less a constitutional rule. And, and at, post Dickerson, there's a, there's a general recognition that we're sort of keeping Miranda, that we're going to have Miranda, at least uh, in the near term, even though there are still members of the court who would probably overturn it if given the opportunity. So. The recent cases and a number of cases in recent years have been more about making it less robust, making Miranda do less work um, on behalf of criminal defendants. And the trio of cases that we have in, in the past term are, are a good example of that. So in recent years, we've had things like, OK, well, statements taken in, in violation of Miranda, that is, from people who haven't been given their warnings or been accorded the, the right not to speak if they've, if they've asserted that right, um, OK, they won't be admissible in court, but we can use them to impeach. So if someone testifies, if the defendant takes the stand in her own defense, let's say, and says something that's contrary to what the confession that she gave in violation of Miranda, well, now we can use those statements. So you see how the right becomes just a little bit smaller after a decision like that. Or, uh, OK, so you have the right you know, not to be questioned without getting your Miranda warnings, but if there's an emergency, then it's OK, and we're going to let law enforcement do that. So these little exceptions start to, to punch holes in the doctrine. And three decisions um, do something along those lines in the recent term, and I'm going to try to put them on a, on a spectrum. One was 9-0, one was 7-2, one was 5-4. So you can sort of tell how interesting they are um, <laughs> by, by the votes. Um, the 9-0 the decision is in a case called Maryland versus Schatzer. Um, and there is a rule uh, rising out of Miranda based on a 1981 case called Edwards versus Arizona that once a suspect has, in in accordance with her Miranda rights, asked for an attorney during questioning, questioning has to cease, and she can't be questioned further until a lawyer has been made available to her, or she decides herself to reinitiate questioning, like alerts law enforcement that she wants to continue the conversation and reinitiates without anyone asking her questions. Um, so the question had been, well, how robust is that? Right, how long does it last? Um, and it, it, was, it was challenged in this case, and the facts will indicate to you why I think it's 9-0 and, and not a particularly controversial decision. Um, Schatzer is a case about uh, a, a prisoner who was already in custody for a different offense who had allegedly abused his three-year-old son, sexually abused his three-year-old son, and was questioned by a detective about this abuse. And in the course of that questioning, asserted his Miranda rights, and so appropriately questioning ceased, and the detective went away. Um, the individual was then returned to the general prison population uh, in Maryland for the offense, the different offense that, that he was already serving time on. Two and a half years later, they reopen the investigation of the sexual abuse. And a different detective comes and questions the individual two and a half years later. 
Now, he's not in the interim been provided separately with counsel to consult about with respect to the sexual abuse. He has not indicated any interest um, in reinitiating contact with law enforcement to discuss it. But he does then speak to the second detective, and those statements um, are introduced at his later trial on the separate sexual abuse offense. Um, so no one's feeling a, a ton of sympathy for Mr. Schatzer, and um, the, the ultimate decision that those statements were admissible um, is 9-0. What's interesting about the decision is it was two and a half years that had lapsed between. And one can see fairly readily on the facts how after two and a half years, whatever coercion you might have been feeling during your initial confrontation with the detective has sort of dissipated. You've gone about your, you know, granted he was in prison, but different offense. He's gone back into the general prison population. He's gone on with his daily activities. Um, he's not feeling coercion. And Miranda's preoccupied with the feeling of coercion that you have when you encounter law enforcement in a custodial setting. Um, but Justice Scalia wrote the opinion and took the opportunity to decide 14 days is enough time for the <laughs> coercion to dissipate. So anyone who was questioned again after 14 days after the custodial, the initial custodial interrogation, that's enough. Um, and there's something mildly cynical about this because it's a clear example of judicial legislating, which Justice Scalia does not favor. Um, there's a to, clause in the Constitution. <laughs> the 14 days. There's the 14 day clause. Oh, 14 amendments, 14 <laughs> days. Oh, yeah. 14, good 14 number. Day, wrote the opinion, just pulled 14 days, and I decided, I think after 14 days, you're no longer going to feel this coercion that we think that you feel um, because of Miranda. Um, now, why is Justice Scalia engaged in, in this sort of legislative behavior um, that he doesn't otherwise favor? Well, because he doesn't think that Miranda uh, is, he actually has, in, 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 he dissented vociferously in Dickerson, the case I mentioned from 2000. He thinks Miranda should be repealed. Um, in his view, Miranda is judicial legislating. So sky's the limit as far as he's <laughs> concerned. Um, and, and Miranda, in his view, is a judicially created requirement. Has no constitutional provenance. It's just, you know, judges making rules. So let's make another rule, 14 days. And hereafter, um, that is the rule. Um, so it's, you know, it's not a decision with which many people would disagree on the facts. Um, the 14-day requirement, which came literally out of nowhere, um, is, a, is, a, is an interesting quirk of the case. A another question about Miranda is, okay, so we get that you have to have your warnings, but how do they have to be phrased? How much information do you have to get? And, and the court has repeatedly held there's no particular script. Every police department, every law enforcement agency has forms that they follow. They try to, to make sure that you're getting, the, that those four elements are covered. That you have the right to remain silent, that what you say is going to be used against you, that you're entitled to an attorney, and that if you can't afford one, we'll get one for you. Um, you try to cover those bases, but there isn't a script, even though you think there's one if you watch enough TV. Um, and, and police departments can make up their own language. They can augment it with additional warnings, as long as they sort of cover those bases. Um, the, Florida versus Powell is the 7-2 to two decision. Uh, it's a, a case about the warnings that were used by the Tampa Police Department. It's a case involving a felon in possession of a firearm, uh, a serious offense that, that in this case led to uh, 10 years of imprisonment. Um, and this particular suspect was told um, that he had the right to talk to a lawyer before answering questions. And if, if you're alert, you've noticed that having the right to talk to a lawyer before answering questions isn't exactly what Miranda guarantees. You can have the lawyer with you during the questioning. Um, and the controversy here is, well, did the suspect understand that, sure, you could consult with a lawyer, but what good is that going to do me? Because I still have to face this law enforcement agent in a potentially coercive custodial setting and answer questions. Um, and so the, the question is, you know, in fairness, Powell was also advised that at any time during questioning, he could invoke the rights. It was just never made clear that it was actually having the physical presence of a lawyer during questioning that was part of what was, what was guaranteed or, or, or what he was being advised that he could avail himself of. Um, but nonetheless, Justice Ginsburg wrote an opinion, it was a seven to two opinion, Stevens and Breyer uh, dissented largely on the basis of what they view as the requirements of the Florida Constitution, which um, if, they're, if they're more stringent than the federal constitutional requirements should have controlled in the Florida case. Uh, and, and held that there's no particular language in which these warnings have to be conveyed, um, and that with that language, the essential message of Miranda was, was delivered uh, to, to the suspect, so that that was sufficient. So the second thing we know, um, not only do, they, do the rights not last all that long, did the, the coercion dissipates, but also um, with there are the requirements of the actual warnings, the script of them, is fairly loose. Um, finally, the, the controversial decision, the 5-4 decision in a case called Berkey's versus Tompkins. Um, and this is a decision about, okay, so 
you've given, given your warnings, and we know how long they last, but what do you have to do to just, just to alert law enforcement to the fact, it's okay, I get it, but I want to talk to you anyway. In other words, to waive your rights under Miranda. What, 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 are the, what has to come out of your mouth before law enforcement can assume that you're ready to talk and proceed with an interrogation? Um, there had been a long-standing question about whether just staying silent uh, was sufficient to invoke your right to stay silent. Um, and this is, the answer is no, uh, after Burgess versus Tompkins. So you would think if you're told you have the right to remain silent, you're given all those rights, and then you sort of nod and keep your mouth shut, that you're alerting law enforcement to the fact that you are availing yourself of those rights and that you're not going to be, to be speaking. Um, and the court in, in this case flipped a, a, a presumption that had been in place before, which is that if you're going to waive your rights, you have to say something very explicit. Not to invoke them, but to waive them, you have to say, I understand my rights, but I want to talk to you anyway. Um, it had been the case that with respect, not to the silence prong of Miranda, but with respect to the right to an attorney, that you had to be pretty explicit. So for example, um, after, after a case called Davis, if you said, hey, do you guys think I need a lawyer uh, to law enforcement, that wasn't enough um, to be invoking your right to an attorney. You had to say something very clear like, get me my lawyer, or I want to call my lawyer, or lawyer, uh, in some cases, um, <laughs> is what people often say. Um, but that it wasn't, uh, but you know, otherwise it wasn't, it wasn't enough just to ask a question or to be a little bit ambiguous about what you were actually uh, wanting. So in Burgess versus Tompkins, the court sort of extended that to the silence prong of Miranda and basically said, you also have to be very clear about what you're asking for in terms of silence, which does flip the presumption uh, previously that you had to be explicit about saying you wanted to talk. Um, this is, it's a murder case, um, and Tompkins had been read his rights from a form uh, which had a very adequate recitation of the Miranda rights. He had refused to sign the form. This is very common. Um, the court has previously held you don't have to actually sign, I understand my Miranda rights. You're often asked to, if you don't, it's, it's not dispositive. Um, hadn't signed the form, but then, for three hours during questioning, said not one word, made not one sound. Um, and at just before the three hour mark, um, they switched tactics. This is also very common in interrogations. And the, the de suspect later, the defendant, was asked, do you believe in God? Yes, he answers. Um, then he was asked, do you pray to God? And he answered, yes. And then here's the zinger, because this is always the question they asked, do you pray to God for forgiveness, for shooting, in this case, the, the victim of the murder? Yes. And that yes, that one word answer, uh, was introduced at his trial as a confession and he was convicted. And the question is, were his Miranda rights violated? Because he had sat there silently for three hours and they hadn't stopped questioning. Had he invoked, had, should they have stopped asking him questions um, during that three hour period? And, and the court, as I said, um, said no. Um, that you have to be uh, much more formal and much more explicit about invoking your right to, to silence. An interesting detail about this opinion, I'll, I'll stop with this, is that uh, it provoked a very strongly worded dissent from new justice uh, Sonia Sotomayor, um, and who, who had not shown a lot of cards um, previously in criminal procedure cases. Um, and I'm not sure how telling this is, but um, she, uh, she basically recognized this flip that they've done um, about how explicit you need to be previously about a waiver, now about invoking your right to silence. Um, and she said, you're, you're imposing a requirement that is compelling suspects to speak precisely when they've been told that they don't have to. Um, and she called this decision a substantial retreat from the protections of Miranda. Um, I'm not sure that any of these decisions constitutes a substantial retreat from the protections of Miranda, but I think that what Justice Sotomayor might have been responding to and what a lot of commentators have responded to is the aggregate sense um, that there is little by little sort of chipping away at some of the <coughs> fundamentals of the decision and that that's a process that we're likely to see continue. All right, well, thank you, Professor Griffin. Uh, let me, we have to end promptly at 1.15, so let me just uh, open it up to questions if folks have questions they'd like to ask uh, any, of our, any of our commentators today. I got yes. one for Professor, Professor Griffin. With these Miranda rights cases that are kind of taking bites out, you mentioned the first one was from Scalia, the second one was from Ginsburg. Is this kind of a, a uniform thing across the spectrum of legal philosophy, or is this more geared towards one side of the spectrum? Uh, this is just a discussion that um, Professor Siegel and I have had at similar events about whether the, the Roberts Court in general is engaged in a um, sort of programmatic um, process of uh, trying to curtail fairly significant rights in a variety of realms. 
Um, I think in the criminal procedure realm, it's it's not even subtle. I mean, I actually think that uh, that we're term by term. We've certainly seen it with regard to the exclusionary rule. There were some major decisions in the last term about the Fourth Amendment. Um, you know, it, it, making the exclusionary rule as if the remedy has very little application. So you know, like having it apply in fewer cases, expanding exceptions. Um, then the right itself is not a particularly uh, robust right. So where the court disagrees with some longstanding precedents, rather than overturn those decisions, it's not uncommon to see if, by accretion um, the right itself diminish. And, and I think in the Roberts Court has declared itself, even in some cases, uh, to be engaged in that. Um, it, it, very, very early years of the Roberts Court, there was a lot of talk about, um, you know, refereeing and umpiring and and um, and being very uh, and, and and you know and doing everything by consensus and 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 being a non-activist or you know whatever all these loaded terms that again I, I advocate for the quotation marks and using them um, I uh, and and I think that that's just all bets are off um, and I think that's been true for the last three or four terms I, I do I do think most of the action in in rolling back Miranda which I think is what's going on the court is split ideologically five to four. I think you've got uh, a program that's been signed on to in full by Chief Justice Roberts, Justices Scalia, Thomas, and Alito, and in part by Justice Kennedy, right? And to the extent there are limits, right, there are going to be limits imposed by Justice Kennedy. I think the Ginsburg opinion is more exceptional. I think she said, look, we never said this in magic words. We never said there's a formula. This is good enough. You have the right to counsel, right, before you answer any questions, and you can invoke the right at any time. And she says, for the court, the defendant would have to imagine that if counsel can't be present, then after every question, counsel has to leave the room, consult with the attorney, and go back into the room. And she says, this is good enough, right? This is good enough under our precedence. Um, the, the most reasonable inference, even without being explicitly told, is that the counsel could be there. Um, but I don't think that's characteristic. She has in no way joined, um, joined the project of seeing Miranda as uh, a mistake or an aberration that needs to be either limited or overruled. And she was in the dissent in Tompkins. I, yeah, if that was your question about whether Ginsburg is, right. is joining some, no. I think that was just not a very controversial case. Yeah. Other questions? All right, well, then, you know what? Let me, uh, we've got a, a, a Sarah, Professor Beale, if you need to go, uh, you, should feel, you should feel free. I know you've got a lot, a lot going on, but you have a few minutes. I could talk about one more case. Otherwise, I can... Take more questions. All right, let me talk about uh, let me talk about Graham. Thank you very much for coming. Let me talk about uh, let me talk about Graham against Florida. This is an important Eighth Amendment question. Uh, this is the question is whether it's cruel and unusual punishment in violation of the Eighth and Fourteenth Amendments to impose a life uh, uh, a sentence of life without possibility of parole for a non-homicide crime committed by a juvenile. Right. So the uh, Roberts Court, like the Rehnquist Court, has been moving uh, significantly the area of the Eighth Amendment and the area of cruel and unusual punishment. And the doctrinal formulation the court has used is from a 1958 case called Trop against Dulles, right, in which what's cruel and unusual is determined by uh, contemporary uh, evolving standards of decency, right, evolving standards of decency. What does that provide? What happens in this case? Well, Terrence Graham in 2003 at age 16 helps to rob a Jacksonville restaurant. And during the robbery, an accomplice beats the manager with a steel bar. Uh, Graham ends up uh, being sentenced to one year in jail and three years probation for this crime. Uh, the next year, while he's out on probation, he's now 17 years old, Graham and two 20-year-old accomplices uh, commit a home invasion robbery. Right? And in 2005, a judge sentences Graham to life for violating his probation. Right? So it's a sentence for life without possibility of parole for a non-homicide crime committed by a juvenile. And the question is whether this violates the Eighth Amendment as well as the Fourteenth Amendment, right, which the court has long held to incorporate the Eighth Amendment. Well, some background. Uh, the court has previously held that it's constitutional, it's permissible to sentence an adult to life without possibility of parole, even for committing uh, nonviolent offenses. In a couple of decisions from 2003, uh, Ewing against California, Lockyer against Andrade, these were laws that arose under California's three strikes law. Uh, and in some of these cases, for example, in the Andrade case, uh, the court held 5-4 that it's okay for the third strike to be uh, stealing $153 worth of children's videotapes from a Kmart store. Uh, that was the third strike, and there was no possibility of parole there. It was for 50, for 50 years. Um, at the same time, when it comes to juveniles and Roper against Simmons, 
Uh, the court in 2005 held that it did violate the Eighth and Fourteenth Amendments to impose the death penalty for a crime committed by a juvenile. Right? So the question in Graham against uh, Florida is what happens when you have the juvenile committing the crime but it's a non-homicide crime? What happens when it's not the death penalty but it's life without possibility of parole? And here the court splits 6-3. You have Justice Kennedy writing for himself and Justices Stevens, Ginsburg, Breyer, and Sotomayor. Right? So for himself and four other justices, a five-justice majority, and they hold that it does violate the Eighth and Fourteenth Amendments. Um, that it's inherently cruel and unusual punishment to a sentence, a juvenile, to life without possibility of parole, right, at least when the crime doesn't involve homicide. And Kennedy writes that a state need not guarantee the offender eventual release, um, but he says if it imposes the sentence of life, it has to provide him or her with some realistic opportunity to obtain relief before the end of the term. And how does the court decide that this uh, compromises evolving standards of decency? Well, Justice Kennedy says there are only 129 people in the entire country uh, who are serving uh, such a sentence for this crime uh, that they committed as an individual, uh, as a juvenile, and 77 of these folks are in the state of Florida, right, out of which this, this case itself arises. Uh, the court, like it did in Roper in the juvenile death penalty case, talked about differences uh, in men emotional and mental development, right, in capacity for change and rehabilitation that distinguishes adults from juveniles. The court also... Uh, again, controversially, uh, look to what's going on in the rest of the world and said nowhere else in the world right, would an individual be sentenced to life without possibility of parole uh, for a non-homicide crime committed while one is in the age of minority. So that's five justices. You've got the chief justice concurring in the judgment. Right? So interestingly, I think um, counter to how many would predict, right, he's with the court on the bottom line that there's a violation of the 8th and 14th Amendments here, right? but he doesn't want to go with the categorical rule. He doesn't want to say categorically, right, you can't uh, impose a life without possibility of parole for a non-homicide crime committed by a juvenile. He says in this case, right, this sentence is so disproportionate to the crime that it violates the Constitution. So that's how you get six votes in the majority. Then you've got a three-justice dissent. You've got uh, Justice Thomas uh, joined in full by Justice uh, Scalia and joined uh, mostly by Justice Alito. Right, and uh, Thomas disputes the facts in the U.S. and abroad and says it's wrong as a matter of principle to take international opinion or practice into consideration. Um, uh, Thomas says you've got 37 states, D.C., and the federal government that have laws on the books that allow this punishment for this crime. Right? He says the fact, um, uh, this represents a supermajority of states that favor the punishment. And he says the fact that it's rarely used means just that it's rarely used. It doesn't mean that it's contrary to evolving standards of decency. It doesn't mean it's a punishment that the nation abhors. So Graham is an important decision. It's the first time that the court excludes an entire class of offenders from a particular, portion, uh, from a particular form of punishment outside the context of the death penalty. Um, and the court did prohibit such sentences in the future, but it didn't order release of all those who are now serving life without possibility of parole uh, for crimes they committed when they were under 18. Instead, the court says that these individuals are entitled to a meaningful hearing, right? Some meaningful hearing at some point in the future to determine whether release is appropriate. And it's not clear whether this will be much of an obstacle uh, to states that are affected by the decision. It's also not clear whether a very long determinant sentence is going to be constitutionally problematic. What about not life without possibility of parole, but no possibility for 40 or 50 years? Right? Not clear at this point whether that's constitutional, but for the time being, my own guess would be that it is. Um, what about, finally, a, co a crime involving homicide? Right? What if the juvenile uh, commits, uh, gets life without possibility of pro parole for a crime involving homicide as opposed to the crimes at issue in this case? Again, not at all clear what the court will do. So a significant decision, and one like many of these decisions that leaves many questions open and uh, lawyers and litigants in business for years to come. Thank you all very much for coming, and uh, I'll see you on Wednesday. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.